From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 207, recorded on August 11th, 2022. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Hello, Looking Dixon. out the window, it is. It looks like a nice day, but it's really very hot and humid. Well, that's not that's, incompatible. That's the best thing nice. I can say for it. <laughs> hot and that's humid is great. You like hot and humid? I love it. I'm a Mediterranean <laughs> at heart. Hey, I also, was, uh, go ahead. <laughs> also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, everybody. I'm with you on the Mediterranean theme, Vincent. <laughs> I like it hot and humid. I love the it. The luckiest part love of it. living in Scotland is that you get the southern part of the Gulf Stream that comes and warms your shores. But that's no concession when it's minus 20 degrees out. It's still there, but you don't know it. <laughs> it seems like it's been a while since our last trip. It's longer than usual, correct? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, there was a break. There was a, we took a break. All right. There well, was some delay. We were supposed to record last week, and it got oh, pushed off right. a little. That's true. That's a little true. Bit, yeah. Okay. Well, here we are that's again. True. And let's get to our clinical case. Daniel, remind us what we have here, please. All right. For everyone tuning in for the first time and those tuning back in, our case from TWIP 207 was a woman in her 20s uh, received a call about this uh, young lady who had spent some time in Kenya six months earlier and vomited up a worm. Um, the, uh, the clinician calling me had certain things in mind. Um, and one of my first questions was, how big was that worm? And right. the worm was 0 0.5 centimeters in length. It was sent to the lab. It was moving. Um, and then we got a little more history uh, once, uh, once I actually got this size pinned down. So maybe start thinking that maybe the Kenya wasn't the story. Um, and we found out that earlier that day, she and her friends went out to have sushi. This was one of these uh, local mom and pop sushi places. Uh, she had some of the uh, nigiri style, the, the raw uh, fish. She also had some rolls, um, which uh, people may know that I don't eat rolls. I really want to be able to inspect that fish myself. Um, and she developed horrible abdominal pain, followed by vomiting, and then uh, retrieved this uh, little guy. All right. Here's uh, here we had a, a quite a few guesses. Uh, Dixon, can you please read the first one? I would be happy to. Charlene writes, "Twip case study. <clears throat> the young sushi consumer likely has anapsychosis caused by consuming the live herring worm. Supportive care usually is all that is needed. Most people believe themselves to have food poisoning, in quotes, manage with self-care and do quite well. No pharmaceutical prescribing required. Thank you. Christina. Peter writes, dear host, as soon as I heard sushi, I knew that was the source of the parasite, thanks to early episodes of TWIP. But I had to look up the nematodes because all I could think of was Ascaris. The answer is Anisakis. I already won a book and thank you for that. I am so happy Daniel and Christina joined the show. Each made a great show even better. Question for the hosts. Do you ask if sashimi has been flash frozen or do you trust reputable establishments are doing that? Or do you, do you avoid sashimi or pickled fish or ceviche? Thanks for an entertaining, informative and occasionally incredibly moving show. For all who are new to TWIP, listen to Dixon's story starting at the 2030 mark of TWIP 11, one times three million to see what I mean, Peter. Oh dear, oh dear. Who's an MD Dixon, in you Colombia. you can be moving at times. <laughs> well, I've only moved about four times in my life, but <laughs> I know what you meant. Sarah writes, dear Dr. Racaniello, Des Pommiers, Griffin, 
and Nala. It's currently 21C70F in the hospital call room. I write from as a newly minted PGY1. I listened to the episode this morning before coming in. For this young patient who vomited up a small moving worm after eating sushi, I was ready to say Anasakis, but then the worm was only five millimeters in length. Four out of five of the worms my brain associates with fish are too long or wrong morphology. Diphilobothrium latum, an enormously long, segmented, and very cool tapeworm, my favorite. Clinorchus and Opus thorcus flukes, and Asacus a nematode, a nematode around two centimeters in length. This leaves Nathstoma. Other non-fish associated worms that I think about are Ancyclostoma duodenale hookworm, Strongyloides decoralis threadworm. However, the clinical picture is most consistent with early nathostomiasis, the phase before the worm moves out of the intestines to cause cutaneous manifestations. I think she could be treated with albendazole or ivermectin. I rejected the ancyclostoma idea because I think ancyclostoma stay hooked to the intestines. And if she did pass anything, I'd expect eggs in the stool rather than live worm in the vomit. Also, I think they cause a rash if I'm not mistaken. I rejected Strongyloides stercorellus because these worms track under the skin visibly and people can see them and say they itch terribly. Also, I think they migrate through the lungs, so I would have expected her to complain of cough. The only bad thing about seeing a new TWIP episode is that it means I have to wait an entire month for the next one. Thank you for making learning so fun. Immensely grateful, Sarah. Uh, Anthony writes, this case seems like a classical case of anisakid food poisoning treatment, albendazole, 400 milligrams orally twice daily for one week. The Japanese government has an interesting flyer about ways to prevent getting sick off fish. I paraphrase it below. Cooking with heat, freezing. Um, note, however, wasabi, soy sauce, vinegar, and other condiments will not kill anisakis. When making vinegared mackerel... One means of preventing anisakis infection is to freeze the meat for at least 24 hours after salting and vinegar. Do not eat fish organs raw. Remove intestine or internal organs as quickly as possible. Hope all is going well, Anthony. All right. Back to you, Dixon. <clears throat> Claudia writes, Dear Doctors Naula, Racaniello, Dupamier, and Griffin, I discovered this week in parasitism over a year ago as a spinoff from TWIV, and now I am hooked on both programs. However, this is the first time I'm writing to you in response to the case study about a woman in her 20s who vomits a small worm after eating sushi. <clears throat> I was almost led into confusion by the little tricky piece of information provided by Dr. Griffin when he added that the woman traveled to Kenya six months before the worm incident. However, when examining all of the information, <clears throat> I believe the patient did not get infected in Kenya, but in the United States. After I read the CDC website and consulted Parasitic Diseases book in PDF, which is available on the Doctors Without Borders website, um, I'm sorry to have to correct that right away, but it's Parasites Without Borders. <laughs> My best guess is that the patient ate sushi infected with anisakis worms. These worms are present in raw or undercooked fish or squid, and therefore can be found in sushi. I could not tell or imagine whether she ingested only one worm, and I could not find any reference in the literature about how likely it is to ingest only one worm when eating raw fish infected with an Asakis worms. In any case, I hope she was lucky enough to expel all the worms she ate when she vomited. This is because when worms are not vomited, they can invade the gastrointestinal tract, die there, and produce inflammation, gastric pain, nausea, and possibly diarrhea. According to the Merck Manual and your book, the treatment consists of the physical removal of the worms. Albendazole, 400 milligrams, micro, milligrams administered orally twice a day for 3 to 21 days is another option. Thank you for all you do to educate the public. Y'all, along with the TWIV team, are my favorite YouTubers. <laughs> Much love, Claudia. Sound like Bill Clinton there, Dixon. No, <laughs> I was trying to figure just, out what accent that was. Just it didn't, sound to, like a, it didn't sound like a Claudia accent. I'm trying anyway. to fit in. <laughs> just trying to fit in. <laughs> uh, uh, Christina, you're next. 
I think I'm going to do two. Fred writes, anisakiasis. And that's it. (laughs) So shall I do the next one as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. (laughs) Stuart writes, hello all, first time emailer here, and it's a near perfect 23C and 53% humidity day here in sunny Farth, North Queensland, Australia. The woman is likely suffering from anisakiasis caused by an anisakit parasite. There seems to be a few long-term sequelae from this and treatment, twice daily albendazole, is not likely necessary. Follow up in a few weeks to ensure no residual symptoms, um, for example, abdominal pain, would seem appropriate, however. If this woman is a, rec- is a regular at said restaurant or eats a lot of sushi, then maybe a hunt for ectopic infection could be worthwhile. In terms of acquisition, the patient would have eaten the culprit undercooked or raw fish or squid within the recent hours today. Prevention is through thorough cooking or appropriate freezing of the food item. I believe the travel history is a red herring, though I'm interested in hearing the approach and answers from the others and the team. Thanks, Stuart. How many answers will use this phrase? I can't remember where that little star was. Oh, I think he's uh, referencing the, the red herring. How oh, the red herring. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Daniel. All right. Renee writes, greetings from an abnormally sunny Seattle. My guess is anisakiasis caused by the anisakid nematode. She must have ingested the larvae when she went out to eat sushi. Renee. P.S. I have not won a book yet. All right, I'll grab another. Byron writes, dear TWIP hosts, it is a lovely 84F29C afternoon in Naperville, Illinois. A bit too warm for my taste. Guess that is why I'm living in Illinois. Um, But I know I am a minority. Another month, another case. TWIP is the gift that keeps on giving. Still hoping for a book at some point. Wish me luck. It is relatively short case. Woman in 20s, vomited up a worm, still moving. My guess is that this case is anisakiasis caused by anisakis, often found in raw fish and sea mammals, according to pd 7 a Symptoms could include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, mild fever, and diarrhea with mucus and blood in the stool. Sometimes the worms are expelled through cooking or vomiting. It is interesting that flash freezing or cooking can prevent such infections. Did that restaurant mention extra fresh sushi on the menu? I recall eating sushi directly carved from a tuna visiting Palau. It was a lovely place by the ocean and the fish, it sure tasted fantastic. Luckily, I was fine afterwards or maybe the extra alcohol helped as well. Again, thank you for the show and proving such great education to the public, especially for the people who are interested but did not pursue this as a professional. A bit of regret, have to say. Hope all of you had a great rest of the day and be safe. Byron. Daniel writes, today it's 24C and there is not a cloud in the sky. This is pretty uncommon when you live close to the mountains. To take advantage of such an event, I went to the beach to watch the sunset. So where could this person be living near the beach and the mountains? Hmm. Could that be California, Daniel? British Columbia. Yeah, okay. I guess there are a lot of places. I looked at the bottom. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you looked at the bottom. Yeah, I'm just trying to to be clever. Canada. It has to be a beautiful place up there. With the image of a glowing orb vanishing behind the horizon still in my mind, I can now think about the next case. The (laughs) fact that the woman ate sushi and then developed acute abdominal pain. uh, Abdominal pain. I immediately think of Anisakis. These parasitic nematodes have a life cycle involving fish and marine an- mammals. We humans have a similar digestive system to marine mammals, but it is not similar enough for the worm to carry out its normal life cycle. A few hours after ingesting fish containing the larval stage, it tries to burrow through the intestinal wall but cannot penetrate it. This angers the innate immune cells such as mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils, which release a pharmacopoeia of cytokines. Inflammation and severe pain soon follow. I shake my head every time I hear about this happening. It is easily preventable. When will people learn to freeze their raw fish first or fully cook unfrozen fish? Surely this sushi joint knows better. 
There are other nematodes that follow the Ascaris life cycle, hookworms, strongyloides, stercoralis, Ascaris, lumbricordis, which travel up over the epiglottis. It may be possible to cough or vomit these up as well, but they are not associated with sudden abdominal pain. And I think they would be much smaller than 0.5 centimeter at this point in their life cycle because they needed to travel through a hair follicle first, except for Ascaris, which is ingested and then feeds on the liver before traveling to the lungs. My notes are really lacking information on the specific sizes of these nematodes, so hopefully someone can correct me. Cheers, everyone. Daniel from BC, Canada. All right, Dixon. Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club, right? Dear Twip Tetriptych, the patient is a young woman who spent time in Kenya six months prior and complains of abdominal pain with vomiting after eating sushi earlier the same day. A five millimeter worm was found in the vomit. While it is often useful to look for an underlying, a unifying diagnosis, it is possible also that there is a distinct reason for her symptoms and that the worm was found coincidentally. <clears throat> Based on this information, we attempted to construct a complete differential. Infection with Ascaris lumbricoides is the most widespread intestinal helminthosis globally and should be mentioned as a differential. Ingested eggs hatch in the duodenum, larvae then migrate through the liver into the heart and lungs via the portal vein. After attaching to the alveolar capillaries and penetrating the alveolar walls, larvae ascend the bronchial tree to the oropharynx where they are swallowed and return to the small intestine. It is possible that Ascaris could have been coughed or vomited up coincidentally at this particular point in their life cycle. The size of Ascaris does not fit the worm described in the case, and neither do the acute symptoms shortly after ingestion. Geohelminths like Strangeloides and Decatur also follow a similar path in their life cycle, but the larvae are much smaller than the worm described. The fish tape worm Diphilobothrium may be mentioned as a differential due to the fact that the transmission of this tapeworm is also owed to the consumption of undercooked and raw fish. Diphilobothrium species do not cause the described symptoms within a few hours of ingestion. Also, the size of the fish tapeworm does not fit the mentioned size of the worm the patient vomited up. Several species of trematodes can infect the bile ducts of humans and could therefore theoretically be ejected with vomit, with, with vomiting and could theoretically also be responsible for pain and nausea via obstruction of the bile ducts or pancreatic ducts. Opistorchus viverini and Clonorchus sinensis are neither found in the U.S., nor in Kenya, and should therefore be excluded. While Fasciola hepatica and Fasciola gigantica can be found in Kenya, the adults are usually quite a bit larger than five millimeters and are morphologically very distinct. All of these worms are transmitted via un uncooked freshwater fish in endemic regions, so this could hopefully be ruled out by taking a thorough history. Furthermore, the possibility of an artifact should be considered. Non-parasitic worms can be adjusted by accident and can vaguely resemble a parasitic helminth. Some food items can also be mistaken for a worm. <clears throat> Careful macroscopic and possibly histological examination should be able to quickly rule out this possibility. We believe that the most likely diagnosis in this case is anasychiasis. Anasychiasis species can be found in the Pacific, Atlantic, Arctic Ocean, and other cold marine waters. Infectious L3 larvae measure about two sonometers, which fits the size description of the worm mentioned in the case. Well, okay. <clears throat> um, thank you for this great case. All the best, Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. I think it's interesting. Now we have a second parasitology club. We do. Because right? we have the other one in, in England, in the UK. We so do, this is, we do. I like it, the Parasitology Passion Club. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that good? It's wonderful. Um, uh, Christina, you're next. Andrew writes, Kia ora from Pongaroa. The young lady who had sushi in Kenya is most likely infested with Anisa. Anisaki simplex. PD7 tells me that these nematodes can infect sea mammals, crustaceans, and fish, depending on the species. 
Symptom onset is usually quick, from minutes to hours after the ingestion of uncooked or unfrozen fish and can be so severe that it can be confused with a gastric ulcer. Nausea and vomiting, as in this case, or endoscopic removal can present evidence of the worm. It is self-limiting as they die within a few days in humans. I note with pleasure that Dixon is now not the only Twix TikTok star and now Daniel and Vincent <laughs> also have videos up. So I encourage everyone who is on TikTok to follow at Microbe TV and get science education out there on that platform. Na, Andrew. Dixon, you know what TikTok is? It's a Chinese uh, video in which everybody can perform whatever they like. It's okay. a, I don't watch it. Okay, you're on it, though. Apparently, and I just found that out, by the way, I was not informed prior to now. Yeah, well, I you have go no, look myself. You have no privacy, so that's I'll go so look, much. I'll go look myself up right. when this show finishes. Uh, Daniel, you're next. All right. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking out TikTok. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on it now, too. <laughs> Apparently. I'm very excited. Dear TWIP hosts, the air in DC is 545 on the Rankin scale. The barometric pressure is 1,012,000. Oh, this is not large. fair. This is not fair. My <laughs> guess is that the patient experienced anasychiasis. While plenty of other parasitic worms present in the developing world could cause vomiting, they did not seem to fit the size description. The short duration from ingesting sushi to vomiting also suggests anasakis worms. And I will, I'm going to steal another one here. I'm, I'm double timing here. So Elise do writes, it, it. our friend Elise, dear TWIP Collective, uh, you know, if you come and visit Vincent in the incubator, we start giving you that extra little introduction. So greetings from lower Manhattan, where it is remarkably muggy, overcast and 83 degrees F, 28 degrees C. I do have a diagnostic guess for TWIP 207. I believe the patient is suffering from a parasite she encountered here at home, not in Kenya. Mention of the African sojourn being something of a red herring in this mystery, pun intended. I suspect that her locally contracted parasite came from the sushi she ate at the questionable restaurant and that the parasite in questions is anisakis. The patient's symptoms, sudden extreme abdominal pain, experienced shortly after eating, vomiting, expelling a worm, are the exact symptoms described in parasitic diseases. This parasite is a nematode that is found in a range of fish, many of which are typically served raw as sushi. New York City requires restaurants to follow FDA guidelines to freeze fish that is going to be served raw for 15 hours at negative 27 degrees F or for seven days at negative four degrees F, but it is possible that the restaurant she went to did and follow the guidelines. One thing that surprises me is how quickly the body reacts to the parasite. Unlike so many infections, the infection becomes obvious within hours. Why does this reaction happen so quickly? It is because, is it because of the life stage of the nematode at the time it is ingested? Best wishes again and many thanks. Elise from Lower Manhattan. Owen writes, hi, Twip. For this case, my guess is that Kenya is a red herring, fish pun intended. I'd say she got anisakiasis from the sushi. Love this case. Owen. Take the next one. He can. He's coughing. It's all you, Dixon. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, Martha writes, <laughs> greetings, Twip team. As always, I enjoy watching Twip, even if it's a monthly and not weekly. I hope I am replying in time. The patient in case 207 is a woman who ate at a mom-and-pop sushi restaurant. She subsequently became ill and vomited. In the vomitus was a small worm. It is reported that a few months ago she was in Kenya. I believe the Kenya trip is a... That other uh, email was correct. This is a, a cliche at this point, a red <laughs> herring. <clears throat> Most likely the problem is a herring worm, or more formally, one of the members of the genus Anasacus. I think this is more likely than the fish tapeworm, Diphilobothrium latium, which is larger. Anasacus are yet a, another parasite with a life cycle involving multiple animals. The definitive hosts are cetaceans. Humans are a dead end for the worm and 
if that's any consolation to the patient, the worms do not live long in humans, but they may embed in gastric mucosa and require endoscopic removal. Persons may also sometimes be sensitized to worms with a resulting anaphylactic reaction. This can be prevented by cooking, <clears throat> a technique developed by Homo erectus about a million years ago. Uh, of course, H. erectus is distinct, extinct, so one of the many... Uh, one, so one may choose not to follow the, their technique. Freezing the fish can kill the parasite. Perhaps the restaurant owners were unaware of this recommendation and took care to only serve fresh, never frozen seafood. Best wishes to you all from a hot 102 degrees Fahrenheit and dry Massachusetts. Wow. Wow, it is hot. Daniel. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Christina. Christina, yeah, Christina, sorry. it's all you. The Parasitology Club at the University of Central Lancashire writes, Dear two professors, Greetings from the University of Central Lancashire, situated in the beautiful northwest of England. We would like to add our considered opinion on the case of a young woman in her 20s, recently from Kenya, and who developed severe abdominal pain and vomited up a life worm of approximately half a centimeter after a sushi meal earlier that day. The most probable cause of her condition is the nematode anisakis, which may be ingested in raw or undercooked seafood. Thank you for another challenging case, Yaski Rat, on behalf of the Parasitology Club of the University of Central Lancashire. Okay, Daniel. Jacob writes, Dear TWIP, I'm writing a response to your case study in TWIP 207. When I heard mom and pop sushi restaurant, I was immediately apprehensive. I fear that my apprehension was warranted. When you mentioned the abdominal discomfort and sushi, my mind went immediately to Anasaka species. This was partially confirmed by the sudden onset of the distress. The sushi was ingested on the same day as symptom onset. According to my sources, gastric symptoms can develop as soon as a few hours post-ingestion. The size of the parasite is a little low for Anasakis, but I'll maintain my guess. All the best, Jacob. Kimona writes, hoping this entry makes it on time. As for the 20-year-old female vomiting up a little wiggly worm, I vote for anasakiasis caused by the anasakid nematode. She likely ingested a piece of raw sushi fish harboring the parasite within its muscle tissue when released into her stomach. The nematode larva can invade the GI tract tissues facilitated by release of parasite hydrolytic enzymes. The onset of symptoms, such as abdominal pain, can occur within minutes to hours of ingestion, which fits her story and may be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, and even bloody diarrhea. In this case, the vomiting likely expelled the parasite rather quickly after ingestion, and thus prevented further sequela. If the worm remains, it can invade the GI tract. It eventually dies and then may provoke a eosinophilic granulatomous infiltration, granulomatous infiltration, producing an inflamed mass in the esophagus, stomach, or intestine, which may lead to obstruction or peritonitis. As always, so grateful for all these podcasts. Kimona, we're back to Dixon. Christopher writes, good morning, TWIP team. My name is Chris, and I'm a first-year medical student at the University of California, Los Angeles. I am a longtime listener of TWIV, Immune, and now TWIP. This is mostly a thank you email because when times get tough and I lose sight of my path, I can reliably depend on the podcast to refuel my motivation to become an infectious disease doctor. You are all amazing. I am cramming for a neurologic neurology test that is coming up, so I couldn't spend too much time thinking about the case of the woman in her 20s who vomited up a worm 0.5 sonometers in length, but my immediate guess was an nematode worm of some sort, like Anasaka species or Pseudoterranova species, but mostly because that name is really cool. <laughs> the best, Chris. It is a cool name. You know, Pseudo Chernobyl is, is is great. Yeah, Daniel, what is this cramming business in medical school? Is that something exactly. that happens? 
You know, I, I, I have to admit, I'm a bit of an outlier, I guess I will say. Um, I, I was never a big fan of cramming. This, this whole idea that you would memorize stuff and then remember it for the test and then forget it. I, I always like to sort of pace myself um, because, you know, I, I guess in my mind, um, you know, if you're learning this stuff, theoretically, you may want to actually know that stuff in the future. <laughs> and I do think it makes medicine more enjoyable if you study at a point where you, you develop a foundation instead of just basically jumping through each test by cramming. But I don't know. Didn't, didn't you cram for those science classes, Vincent, back in the day? Yeah, sometimes, but it's not very effective, I have to say. I, no. I, I never did as well when I crammed. I, it's much better to learn it in, over the long term, right? Yep. It's yeah, and more- put, it in a, put it in a context. <clears throat> if you understand and it makes sense, it's a lot different than just memorizing facts. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I must it, say that there's a very popular podcast called MedCram that you've been on, and it's very uh, subscribed. So there's something to this cramming. <laughs> okay. For me, it went in one hemisphere and out the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a few more uh, guesses to go. Who wants to lead us off? Oh. Dixon, you you want to go? Dixon first? Sure, you're going to pick on me again? That's fine. (laughs) There was one answer out of all of these that sort of was convincing, and that was uh, Nathostomiasis, because if she had acquired this in Kenya, uh, it's likely that she was not in Mombasa, which is on the coast. And the fish then most likely would not have been seafood, but rather freshwater fish. And nathostomiasis is a freshwater fish transmitted parasite. But I, but I must agree with the consensus, and that is that the Kenya trip was indeed um, to throw you off balance. The uh, worm was acquired weeks or days ago at a local sushi parlor, and um, that's basically what she reacted to: uh, the worm trying to burrow into the mucosa of the stomach, and. Um, That does elicit a reaction. There's no question about it. And up comes the worm and everything else she ate, as a matter of fact, at that point. So I think uh, anasychiasis is a good guess. If I could see the worm, I'd know more. Yeah, and it is, we are going to mention, because the worm did get sent off to a parasitologist. So we're going to get get a solid lab-based diagnosis here. So, Christina, did you? uh... Um, I think I'm I'm also um, going with the with the um, consensus of Anisakis. I've been reading a few papers and I've kind of been thinking, why why, did, why do people get sick so quickly? And I don't know, I find it difficult to imagine that it is just the worm burrowing. I, but I don't know, but I do find that quite puzzling that people get so sick. There were a couple of case studies where people got sick within an hour of eating fish. So that would maybe something that we could look into. But I think I'll, I'll also go for Anisakis. Hopefully, I'm not totally wrong. So, very early <laughs> in the the TWIP series, when it was just mm. Dixon and me, uh, he, we the first twenty five were in episodes on individual parasites, and I remember right. him talking about this yep. and eating sushi and the worm yep, trying to yep, get yep, in yep, the yep. stomach. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it was very, very uh, reminiscent of the, clearly Anasakis in my book. Yeah. Okay. The, the quietest the medical students ever were for any of the lectures that I gave, at least, was I had finished without mentioning anasychiasis. I was talking about ascaris, not anasychiasis. And they started to get up from their chairs and they were slapping their notebooks closed and everything else. I said, but wait a minute, I have a story about sushi. Everybody, I, the entire class, just in one mass, just sat back down again, opened their books. You could hear a pin drop. Because where do you think they were going? <laughs> they were going to lunch. And they were probably, they not all of them, but some of them could have gone to a sushi parlor. So the point is that um, everybody likes those stories, but uh, the person with the worm doesn't like those stories at all. Uh, that's very painful stuff. What is it with parasitology lectures always being straight before lunch? Because mine were too, I remember <laughs> very clearly. <laughs> On the Thursday morning right, from 10 to 12. <laughs> We have to eat too. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's better than right after lunch when everyone's like, so. doesn't matter how interesting your stuff is, uh, eat <laughs> on sleep. 
Um, right. All right. Okay. So um, to give a little background, which is so the, the way I got this call was I got a call from, oh, hey, you got to talk to one of our docs. Uh, they, they got this gal, came back from Kenya. It sounds like they vomited up an ascaris worm. And so I was like, all right, well, let me talk to him. So I got on the phone and uh, they started telling the story. And my first question as sort of in the history was, how big was this? And that's when they said the 0.5. And that's when I said, you know, why don't we go a little bit deeper? Um, and that worm was sent off. It actually uh, came back as an anisocket species, um, sort of clinching the diagnosis. Now, the interesting, and I give a little follow-up. So, um, you know, normally in most cases, right, this person, you can say, hey, you're just going to get better on your own. But a few weeks later, uh, this woman returned still with ongoing pain. Um, so actually at that point, we went ahead and did the five milligrams twice a day for three weeks of the albendazole and they had symptom resolution at that point. So I'll be um, sort of an interesting, because sometimes you end up at that point, uh, sometimes if she had not responded, we might actually do endoscopy. Um, yes. So. yes. So she had more than one worm ingested, presumably, right? So the, the idea is um, that there may have been multiple and then you have this um, you know, reaction to that. And it is interesting to me. I mean, the fact that the albendazole um, is associated with response suggests that they're still alive, which um, interesting. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought that was the case, but yeah. So uh, this <clears throat> presumably was a restaurant that did not adequately freeze the, uh, the sushi, correct? So that, that would, and that's sort of the mom and pop thing. I mean, we had a case, I think maybe we shared on here where it was a, a local gentleman who was, uh, you know, smoking and preparing his own raw fish. Yeah, um, yeah, one yeah. of the emailers who wrote it, it's interesting. If you're, if you're out on a boat and I don't know if people know, I just got back from this uh, overnight race Tuesday into a uh, Wednesday morning. If you follow my Twitter feed, you saw the, the lads and I on this boat and we, we barely missed first place by about 18 minutes in a 12 hour race. It was a very close, exciting race. But if you're out there and you catch a fish and you immediately um, eat sushi from that fish without letting it sit around, you're not at risk. There's actually That's this right. period of That's time right. um, right. where they, they parasites actually have to migrate into the tissue. So if you catch a fresh fish, you immediately fillet it up, make your sushi, um, you're good to go. It's just, you know, the fish gets caught, it gets thrown, it sits around, it starts to get warm. Um, then you, you are at risk. So either eat it right there, right off the hook, or put in some liquid nitrogen or freeze it as I think one of our emailers or, described. Or clean it. Uh, if, you, if you actually got the fish and throw away all the intestines and all the organs, uh, immediately after catching it, that, you can leave the fish sitting around also. Um, yeah, and that's key. You got to do it right away. Live the, yep. the larvae live in the gut tract. Yeah, and then and, they migrate out into the tissue. So just, right. you know, you catch that's that right. fish immediately, uh, exactly. not on my sailboat, but uh, on Martha's <laughs> boat, you can go get those fish right away. Richard, Very my easy pet. to do. You just slide, slit the belly open and yeah. dump them. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly come. right. Exactly right. Richard, my partner ahead, in Christina. Cry, he isolates um, Anisakis from mackerel on a field course with students every year. And he just actually specifically sure. has to ask the fishmonger not to gut the fish so that they have a rich harvest <laughs> of um, worms right, right. upon dissection. Mm. Uh, it's quite, it's quite disgusting, actually. They can be very heavily parasitized, <laughs> those mackerels. Wow. <laughs> Poor fish are heavily parasitized, right? <laughs> well, yeah. All the, all the world's a parasite, Dixon. Well, everybody's got to eat. <laughs> That's how that turns out. The food chain right. starts at the bottom and works its way up. And, um, yeah, you're right. All right. Let's give everybody's away a book. Okay. You have 14... Potential At 14, winners. we're going to pick a random number. Are you ready, Dixon? I am. Number 11. Number 11 would be... Number 11. Uh, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. That's Ben. <laughs> That's <laughs> Ben. Yeah, good. That's Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hand deliver it during the meeting. <laughs> All right. So, um, Ben, send your address to twip at microbe.tv and we'll get you out an autographed copy of Parasitic Diseases. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. 
Um, <clears throat> what's next? Do we have a paper, right? We do. We, we have a paper, and uh, I, uh, I think I may have been the one who selected it, but hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone's <laughs> going to jump in and, and help as we work through this. But it is, uh, well, they unfortunately use the word rebound, which is being used way too often. Um, but malaria transmission intensity likely modifies RTS S slash AS01 efficacy due to a rebound effect in Ghana, Malawi, and Gabon. Um, and actually, I like—I really like this paper. I mentioned it on the ID Puscast, and I did mention that we'd be doing a deep dive. But uh, who are the authors? The first author is... Uh, Griffin J. Bell. Uh, the corresponding author is Griffin J. Bell. Um, and the last author is Michael Emich. We've got a bunch of authors in here in the middle. Um, and this comes to us from about 10 different universities. So Department of Epidemiology, um, Gillings School of Public, uh, Global Public Health, University of North Carolina, Carolina Population Center, University of North Carolina, Center de Recherches Medical de Lambarene, Lambarene Gabon, um, Kintampo Health Center, um, Kintampo, Ghana, uh, Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, University of uh, Ghana, Legon, Ghana, Department of Pathology, Laboratory of Medicine, Brown University, Providence, Division of Infectious Diseases, School of Medicine, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Department of Biostats, Skilling School, University of North Carolina, University of North Carolina Project Lalongwe, Malawi, and the Institute of Tropical Medicine, University of Tübingen, Tübingen, Germany. So I will give a little bit of background and everyone feel free to jump in whenever you want. Um, but we've talked a little bit about this, uh, this first malaria vaccine to be approved and recommended for widespread implementation by the World Health Organization. Um, and this, I have to say, has been a discussed trial um, in global health circles. I know when I was recently in Ghana, we were trying to understand um, because the trials reported lower vaccine efficacies in higher incident sites. Um, we had a lot of ideas about why this might be happening. Someone had the brilliant idea of why don't we look at the data and see if we could get some clues. Um, and the suggestion they have is this might be potentially due to quote unquote rebound in malaria cases in unvaccinated children, um, suggesting that when naturally acquired protection in the control group rises and the vaccine protection in the vaccinated wanes concurrently, malaria incidents can become greater actually in the vaccinated than in the control, resulting in these negative vaccine efficacies. Um, so a little bit about, so this is data from that phase three trial, uh, 2009 to 2014. Um, and they actually um, evaluated this, um, this hypothesis. Um, and, and just to go through a little bit, um, I'm gonna say of what they found and what exactly kind of happened here. So what they started to notice, um, these are the results, over time, the incidence um, decreased in the control group. So over time, right, you have this group that is developing premonition, right? So they're repeatedly being infected with malaria. But what you were seeing is after that third dose, um, you were starting to see an increased uh, amount of malaria in the, um, in the vaccinated group. Um, and actually what happened over time is the efficacy um, started decreasing from an efficacy of 88% until when they get out to about four and a half years, you drop down to only about 14.55%. Right. Um, and actually other groups, it was 82, dropped all the way down to about 27. Um, Daniel, you know, can we'll I ask a question? Maybe just, it, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, do we know why the efficacy decreases so much? So there's a, there's a bunch of things that they're going to talk about here. And, and I think it's interesting and it makes a lot of sense is so, you know, and of course, what are they going to be suggesting a fourth dose? Um, but as you get past three years, and this data is four and a half years after that third dose. So instead of getting a fourth dose, instead of a yearly vaccine dose, which is one um, idea that they're going to suggest, um, here what happened is, you know, as we see, as time goes by, uh, this really has to be an antibody-mediated protection, right? Because we're talking about protection against sporozoites. And as we know, the sporozoites are only going to be in the bloodstream before they end up in the liver for minutes, 
So you're gonna need a certain amount of antibodies and antibodies will contract over time unless they are reminded, unless they are boosted. Um, so I think what we're seeing here, and at least this is what the authors are suggesting, is that uh, you probably can't just stop after those first three. You've gotta keep those antibodies boosted, you've gotta keep them up, or we're gonna see the contraction that we're used to seeing. That so makes Daniel, sense. The, the, the implication is that the memory response is slow and therefore you get infected and then you're screwed, right? Because even if you have a memory recall, it's now too late because you've already established a parasitic infection, right? Right. Exactly. And I think this is a lot like what we know about the meningococcal vaccine is certain infections are so quick that you don't have time for that memory response to boost the antibodies. So you got to keep your antibodies above a certain level. And maybe we know of another disease where this might be the case. So you may require a certain frequency of um, vaccination to keep that up. So here, what they're suggesting is they were doing great in the first couple of years. But then as you go farther and farther out, you're losing efficacy as those antibodies drop. And, and mechanistically, it makes a lot of sense because you only have a few minutes to neutralize the sporozoites once your body is exposed to them. And that few minutes is certainly not enough time for a memory response to trigger. So, uh, you know, what they're suggesting, and I think this is encouraging, is that maybe the reason this vaccine didn't look to be as effective as potentially it can be is this may be a vaccine that you just need to commit to with regular boosting schedule. Right, just like the natural infection. I mean, uh, immunity wanes from year to year, and you can have an infection, you get over it, next year you can get it again, next year you get it again, next year you get it again. And it uh, it actually, uh, with, with plasminium falciparum at least, uh, there's a lot of studies now, I think, that validate the fact that if you're a small child and you are repeatedly infected year one, year two, year three, year four, you, you will live but your cognitive abilities have been diminished greatly by the um, experience of having to fight this infection off basically every year. So yeah, that's why think, this vaccine yeah. looked very promising. But yeah. And it still is probably, but it's about timing, I guess. You're going to come to that, right? Well, no, I think that's the issue. I think what we're seeing from this analysis is that this vaccine may be even more effective than than we realized, than we were seeing from the data. Um, and I think it was because they went back and started looking closely at the data and saying, why are we seeing this difference? I remember we were talking about it, like, why is it better in you know certain incidences, you know, comparing low versus high, high versus low? Um, and they really basically looked through the data and they realized what you were seeing is areas where people had premonition protecting them, if you don't vaccinate, if you don't stay committed to a um, you know boosting regimen, uh, the vaccine is not going to work as well as you want. And, and Dixon, you bring up a great thing. You know, th that premonition it comes with a cost. It comes with impacts on health and cognitive function that's and development. Right. That's right. That's um, right. It's that's much right. better to get a vaccine than to get that immunity by surviving here, a, here. Yeah, a malaria infection. Um, so I, I'm, very, I'm very encouraged by this data. This may just mean oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, this yeah. is a vaccine that you just have to commit. You've got to have an infrastructure, a regular sure. boosting. Yeah, and this this is mainly children we're talking about here. So. That's right. So the only um, long-lasting immunity that I've ever heard of with regards to vaccination was with, although you can consider this not a vaccination, it's giving a live attenuated sporozoite uh, that's been irradiated, it loses its ability to um, to morph into the next stage in the liver, but it stays alive a long time, and it gives off its antigens, its surface antigens, and this vaccine is based on those surface antigens, as I recall, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, in mice, when you give irradiated sporozoites, they are immune for the rest of their lives, but mice only live two or three years. We uh, live a lot longer than two or three years usually, but um, with with malaria, unfortunately, uh, a one-year-old or a two-year-old that has never been vaccinated before and is now missing maternal antibody, and they encounter this parasite, they'll likely die. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, yeah, I think that's, well, several, several points in what you say. I mean, one is that, you know, mice only live for a short period of time. 
So, you know, lifelong protection in a mouse might be two year protection in a person, right? Um, and, and I think that's initially, if you look, people were doing quite well for the first couple of years. You don't really see this phenomenon until you start following them out. So it was a, the 4.5 years. It's really, um, if you look at the figures, I think this is open access, so everyone can actually go look at the figures. I hope it's open access. Um, but you can actually see over time um, the, the differences, um, overall case per persons. Um, and you can see years since third dose, right? Because this is currently a third dose, but maybe it should be a four dose vaccine. Maybe it should just be a three dose primary and then a yearly boost. So we'll have to get more data on that over time. And I also would, would love to, um, to start getting information on, you know, as we like to talk about correlates of immunity, because we're, you know, we're, we're talking about this as antibodies being of a, above a certain level. What is that certain level? Because, you know, there may be a difference in when you're vaccinated, what dose, how do you stay above a certain protective level? It would be interesting if they could develop an oral vaccine that you could take as a pill because injecting every child until they're teenagers or maybe even uh, young adults every single year is a daunting task. You know, it's interesting, and, and I'm actually going to sort of the referenced right to the latest update with the um, with the monkeypox vaccine, just putting these small doses just under the skin. Um, that may that may not be such a heavy lift, and and maybe you could even you know combine vaccines, you know, because a lot of our childhood ah. vaccines are now like you know pentavalent, sure. you know, five different diseases yep, in yep, one. Yep, so. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly a lot less strain on a healthcare system to have robust vaccination programs versus treatment of acute malaria in, in children. Yeah. I and want to... Also, um, <clears throat> go ahead. I'm sorry. Make, I, I just wanted to uh, address this, this, this word rebound, which <laughs> they, they define. <laughs> yeah. So they define it here. And this is important because it's yeah. actually different from the, the way rebound is being used for SARS-CoV-2. Um, they say... Rebound malaria, also called delayed malaria, not to be confused with resurgent malaria. So that's right. the difference. For COVID, they, they use resurgent, right? You get better than you get worse. They call that rebound, okay? But they say, we define this as a period of time when the naturally acquired protection in the control group rises above the protection afforded by the vaccine, resulting in a negative vaccine efficacy. So it's a very specific definition of rebound. Which to me, the word is not right. It doesn't sound like rebound to me. No, so that's these, right. I agree with you. <laughs> but at least they define it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you know, as you know, Vincent, the use of rebound in um, COVID is just, you know, the fact that someone has a negative test and then the next day a positive, suddenly that's rebound without any symptoms or, I mean, just come on. Yeah, they just, everything is rebound because you want it to be rebound because, you know, you want to. Get you that play basketball character. as a young child. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, I thought this is really, I think this is really encouraging um, because this is just such a, um, such a problem for much of the world. Um, you know, malaria, the deaths in children, hundreds of sure. thousands of children still dying. Um, and the idea that we have a vaccine and maybe we're learning a little more about uh, this vaccine, um, this I thought was really promising. So uh, yeah, I recommend that people take a look through this. Um, this is going to help, I think, answer a lot of those questions that we were tossing back and forth. Yes. Um, and hopefully there'll be more, more data uh, to come. Well, there there was one other feature of this paper I think you should probably uh, at least talk about a little bit because yeah. they applied an ecological uh, model with regards to rainfall mm -hmm. to whether or not there will be an outbreak or not because in droughty areas where there's no more rain, uh, there's no more malaria. <laughs> so uh, the people with the vaccine are going to do better because nobody else caught malaria and therefore there will be the group that doesn't suffer as much for the next episode. But if you're in an area where there's always a rainy season, no matter what, then and then they should have actually divided up the areas that they studied because they had a lot of different areas into two groups, you know, droughty and uh, dependable rainfall virtually every spring or every fall, whenever it comes, because that's associated with acquiring new malaria infections. And then that's the time maybe that you should uh, 
hit your booster shot during the rainy season when just before the rains lift and before they all go out again to catch it. Uh, that might work. That actually might work. Yeah, they, you know, for our listeners, they, this figure one, they go through all, I mean, really interesting as Dixon pointed yeah. out, the ecological yeah. aspects. So, you know, they look at uh, population density, elevation, they look at rain, right. Right. Um, right. you know, right. they even look at some other stuff like bed net use, but this whole concept that, you know, I think this is really something to think about is there's a seasonality to certain infections and maybe it takes a while to be established, but with malaria, it basically, because it's so dependent on the mosquito population, yeah. um, you know, and actually the rains affect, um, um, you know, how long the mosquitoes actually live a little longer during the different even times of the rainy season. So if you can actually boost the immunity right before each rainy season, um, that right. might sort of be a yearly booster um, cadence to get into. And I think yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. some of our other diseases may be like that COVID, it'll be a yearly cadence. And, you know, Could maybe with the monkeypox at some point, who knows? So you better stop calling it monkeypox because they're going to change the name. You know that. Well, I'm, you know, and I think maybe, yeah, and maybe now when we realize that it can be such a bad, like, let's go through and let's fix the names of all the different potential pathogens, <laughs> right? I mean, now's the time to do it. Well, um, we so, had, the, yeah. the, every, every virus name is wrong, really. Yeah. But then many, so I, I think that's a lost cause. You can't rename them all. So. <laughs> well, but they, they're going to try. Yeah, what are they're they going to name it, Dixon? Do you know? I don't know? You'll have to ask them. I would have left it the same. I think it's yeah. fine. I mean, a lot of us are just calling it MPX, which takes sort of a stigma play, you know, the MPX, but, you know, yeah, that's just... Uh, so this idea of a, a yearly dose, right, which they propose, then they say, a, well, you know, tough. in our trials, uh, when we tried to give a fourth dose, a good fraction of kids didn't show up. <laughs> it may be challenging, right? They say in... Um, no, no pun intended. Right? Ga Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi... 51, 28, and 22% of children failed to, they dropped out before the fourth, fourth dose. So yeah. that's a challenge, I think, right? I mean, I think you've got to compare the fact that that's a, a trial, right? A research trial versus if you yeah. just say, this is our deal. Because if you look at some of the areas and we always, you know, compare like HIV treatment, like, you know, this Botswana 90, 90, 90. I mean, they have 90% of the people diagnosed, 90% on treatment, 90%. I mean, they do a really good job when they basically say, this is the deal. When you're in a research trial, it's like, yeah, if you want to show up, maybe, you know, you've lost interest, maybe you've moved. Maybe. Okay. Um, but if we actually get into this cadence and also think about like the COVID vaccine, right? It's about to be in the rainy season. People are going to be indoors together. There's going to be more transmission. So this might be a nice, maybe a couple things could kind of be brought together in a, um, you know, in a vaccination program. And then, you know, as I keep saying, that might actually benefit the entire world. So this might be a, uh, exactly. a good investment. So one reason these kids didn't show up for their fourth um, injection might be the fact that they've reached an age where they're absolutely required to do work for the family. And they either work where they live or they work in another place. And then they couldn't come back in time for it. So the older you get, the more likely it is that you're not going to find those people anymore. However, there were some programs in West Africa to eliminate onchocerciasis that required everyone every year to take the drug. And that, by the way, was ivermectin, in case anybody's listening, that is the proper use for that drug. <laughs> Not COVID. Not COVID. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, speaking of ivermectin, <laughs> so we have a bunch of foxes living in our, around our home, and they have scabies. Doris, my wife, who oh, worked on, she decided they mind. have scabies because they're losing all their fur. So she's giving them food with, yes. with veterinary ivermectin in it to I love try it. and... I love Isn't that oh, great? <laughs> we should probably give them the oral rabies virus uh, vaccine also. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I hope everyone liked that. We did. Yeah. By I the way, Dana, what make... is the vaccine... Compo uh, what, what is it made oh, up Christina? of? Christina? You know? Sorry, I, I, I think I have a slightly lack with my connection. That's why I keep interrupting when I don't mean to. I was actually just going to say, because we were talking about maybe doing a fourth vaccine dose, but they do in the discussion mention a study where they actually also observed a, a rebound, if, if I'm using that word, 
um, in clinical malaria um, even after a four dose regimen and that because they were looking for a longer period of time. So I, I think the suggestion that this might be a, a vaccine that we need to just keep on um, boosting, I, I think that comes quite clear from that as well. So, yeah. All right. Uh, D Dixon, did you have a, um, a no, hero? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't. I'm sorry You're I didn't. slacker today, huh? <laughs> you know, I'm neglectful. Right? You're absolutely be, right on be that. Be nice to Dixon. No, no, you don't have to be nice to Dixon. He can be nice to himself. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, then d let me ask Daniel, do you have another case for us? Ah, you know, yes. I, I really, I made it easy for everyone. I actually, this is the first time, and I don't know how many years we've been doing this, I actually pasted the new case study into <laughs> today's show notes. Ooh, I finally occurred to me earlier done. today. I was like, you know, usually I just rely on my <laughs> memory, which is decent, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to paste it in, and then it's there. <laughs> Why would you have to memorize all that? That's right. I've already well, been thinking about cases, it, Daniel. I don't know if you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of the cases are like bright fresh, like I've just seen them. And I'm like, you know what, I'll just share this story. And then, you know, Vincent writes it down. So, all right, we have a new case study. Um, uh -huh. And I will let people know ahead of time, um, we are going to actually have a guest come on next time and do the unveil. I love um, it. So I love it. This is a uh, colleague of mine shared this case with me. Um, it's actually a good friend. He recently sent me a nice care package with treats from uh, treats from Hawaii. Some of them uh, different Thai flavored chips brought me back to our time together in Thailand. Um, so we will have uh, a mystery person on next time telling us about this case. Uh, but this is the case of an adult female resident of Hawaii who presented to the emergency department with several days of fever, abdominal pain, urinary hesitancy, and itchy all over. Um, her white blood cell count was a little elevated, 14,000, um, no uh, eosinophilia, urinalysis suggested a urinary tract infection. Uh, they treated her for an acute urinary tract infection and discharged her home. Now, the following day, she returned to the emergency department because of worsening abdominal pain, um, bilateral hip and leg pain, dizziness, diffu diffuse hyperesthesia, allodynia. Now that's pain from stuff that's normally not painful. So you just touch her feet, her legs, and she just, ow. Um, and this is interesting. I, maybe people will remember this from a previous case where this was, uh, the urine culture from her initial visit just grew normal urogenital flora. I don't think we should say flora, right? It's not growing flowers. Normal urogenital bacteria and other. That's right, microbes. Her <laughs> leukocytosis <laughs> increased and she now had eosinophilia. The white count was 15 0.5, so 15,500 cells per milliliter. The absolute eosinophil count was now greater than 500. It was 574. Um, the rest of the labs were relatively unremarkable. She had CT scans of the brain, the abdomen, the pelvis, all normal. Um, but at this point, she was hospitalized. And the allodynia, the, this pain from stimuli, which are normally not painful, worsened uh, despite attempted treatment with analgesics. And she developed this sensation that she described as feeling like electric eels were swimming through her body. Uh, she had EMG and nerve conduction studies, electromyographic and nerve conduction studies, normal. Um, and at this point, uh, they were thinking and the patient underwent a lumbar puncture a cerebral spinal fluid examination was notable for eosinophilic um, meningitis with 138 WBCs, 13% eosinophils. Um, a diagnostic test was performed. And our next episode, we will have a guest tell us what this diagnostic test revealed. Now, no, this is she a HIV negative, Daniel? Yes, she's HIV negative. And uh, the, she is she living with a family or or on her own? And how are the uh, other family members? Yeah, so at this point, we don't know that. Okay. I'm afraid to ask a question because I would give it away if I did. Well, you, you could ask all the questions you want, but this is all the information you get. 
No, I know that, but <laughs> oh. you know, you give it away because if it's the clue that's missing, your 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 whole face changes. You, uh, yeah. So, in other words, you don't want us to ask any more questions because you don't have any I, answers. I, I think there's a lot here. I think there's enough here. There is a for lot here too. Yeah, there is a lot here. You should at least have a pretty narrow differential and an idea on what that diagnostic test sh or what those diagnostic tests should be. That you're Did they do a, a SARS-CoV-2 test, Daniel? It was negative. <laughs> oh, it was negative. Imagine that. <laughs> How about a monkeypox test? No, apparently that was not even considered in the differential. Yeah, this was <laughs> maybe this was earlier than this outbreak. Yeah, interesting. Okay. But it's it's um, yeah. I'm not going to go there. I'll, I'll yeah, save I think my our I think our listeners <laughs> will uh, will find this uh, pretty well. I, yeah. I hate to say that because then people are like he said it was easy. <laughs> he said all the clues were there. I think they are quite well hidden, but they're all there. I think they're all there. I think they're all sort of put in. The I think Christina and I are in the same wavelength. <laughs> all right, that's yeah. uh, that's your clue, folks. Get to it. You have about a month. We should be back uh, mid-September-ish. And uh, meanwhile, that's TWIP208. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send your guesses comments, et cetera, to twip at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, do consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. A pleasure as always. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Christina Nall, Christina Nall is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. It was so, this was fun. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. have been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. And we'll be back soon. Another TWIP. It is, is Parasitic. 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 Parasitic.